Brothers and sisters, our New Testament scripture reading today is from Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus, um, the closing verses of Ephesians chapter 4 going into the beginning of chapter 5. So then, putting away falsehood, let all of us speak the truth to our neighbors, for we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not make room for the devil. Thieves must give up stealing. Rather, let them labor and work honestly with their own hands, so as to have something to share with the needy. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up, as there is need, so that your words may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with which you were marked with a seal for the day of redemption. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander, together with all malice, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. The word of God for all God's people this day. Amen. Disagreeing without being disagreeable. I don't know how much relevance this message will have to the fact that we are in a political campaign, but if you can find ways to apply it, brothers and sisters, please do. We need it. Amen? Amen. So when you were a child, what did you understand Christian speech, Christian speech to be? Now you probably couldn't have put it into words when you were a child. <laughs> but what did you understand Christian speech to be? What did it include? And what did Christian speech exclude? If you grew up in a church or Christian family, you would have experienced it directly. If you didn't, in most cases, you probably still had a sense of it from folks in your life or in the community who were a part of the Christian faith in some way. So I would like you to engage with one or two other people to answer very briefly. We'll only have a minute or a minute and a half. As a child, what did you think Christian speech was? What did it include and what did it exclude? All right? Find a partner or two. All right. Thank you so much. So, let us, let's just all hear from about three of you. Um, what did you think Christian speech was when you were a child? What did you share or what did you hear? Uh, grace at meals. Grace at meals, yes. Jeff. Well, really, it's centered around the golden rule. Uh-huh. It's centered around the golden rule, all right. Yeah, two. You have the anger outside, don't bring it in the house. Ah. Uh huh. If you had anger going on some part of your life, don't bring it home into your house because your home is a place of peace. Yeah, okay. And one more? James, Jim. Don't use a bad word you name on the street. What was excluded? Don't use the bad words you name on the street. The content of Christian speech, my friends, has changed dramatically in the past 50 years, as has our culture. Here are things that we talk about a lot now and try to address to heal or to, to change. 
In the 50s, early 60s, when I was growing up, I don't think I ever heard about any kind of abuse. I don't think so. I rarely heard, did we even use the word addiction very much? Maybe alcoholism, but that was about it. Sexual orientation never got mentioned. In fact, in many cases, people didn't even realize um, what was the dominant population, what was happening. And diseases, some of you may, now I grew up in the Midwest, diseases, cancer was a little bit, um, you didn't necessarily talk about it when someone had cancer. And if it was gender related, male or female cancer, then you probably didn't talk about it. So all our experiences, we grew up in different places in different times may be different. But we are talking about things in quite different ways in certain areas now. Uh, and we have a sense of the use of speech in a transformational way that I certainly did not experience growing up in the church in the 50s. And I'll try to clarify what I mean by that at this time. So Ephesians, Paul is talking about how you behave, how each of us can invest in making our Christian community healthier. Can I have an amen? And he's focusing here in this section on how we use our voice. So speaking for Paul is connected to discipleship. It's connected to maturing in faith. It's a crucial part of our spiritual path and walking with the Lord. So Paul says you need to put away falsehood and tell the truth. Is there a child here who hasn't told, hasn't heard that? Put away falsehood and tell the truth. Well, I went to my files this week to see what I might have related to today's message. And one of the, I was looking for voice things, right? Speak related, communication related. And one of my files is entitled lying. So I opened it up and inside was a clipping. Now the clipping is from 2001. So the, the research is over a decade old. But it was a report of a study done and then publicized by the Center for Disease Control and Prevention that showed that women, 278 women were in the survey, who were asked soon after, immediately after the birth of their child, whether they had used alcohol at all during the, year, the, the months, the weeks of their pregnancy. Seven out of the 278 said, yes, I did drink. A few years later, they did a follow-up. 32 women out of 278, the same women, now said that they had drunk. So how does this happen? How did it happen that over four times the number of women, several years later when asked, when you would think they wouldn't remember as well, right, now admitted? Well, I'm not going to try to answer that question. We can each have our understandings. Uh, I would add that the Center for Disease Control said they thought that probably it was almost half of the women had actually done some drinking during the time. But what I think it speaks to is the fact that telling the truth and lying is not always simple. Can I have an amen? It, is, it, is, it can be complicated. Sometimes, praise God, it is simple. Of course, sometimes when it's simple, it's still difficult for us to do it. Some, but sometimes it's clear. Other times, it isn't, for various reasons. Well, when Paul says we are to build up the body of Christ in the way we use our voice, he is talking about the word intention. That is a word I did not hear as a child. I did not hear as a youth. I did not hear it in the mass culture, and I certainly did not hear it in church. It, it's a concept that's a part of our faith, but we didn't use that term. In the past 50 or the past 20 years, that, that term has become much more in use for a lot of reasons, including people like Wayne Dyer and others who have written books about it, not least because of Oprah <laughs> and many other things. So now we talk about intention. So when Paul says, the way you use your voice, you need to do it, he doesn't use the word intention, but that's what he's talking about with the intention to build up the body of Christ. Amen? Now, he's talking about that, 
He also talks about anger early on. Now, we didn't mention anger when I asked you how you understood. Well, actually, Chu did refer to anger in not bringing it home with you. Uh, but when I grew up um, in, in the Midwest um, as a Christian, um, basically what I learned about anger was to suppress it, at least verbally. That was pretty much what I was taught. Is that what Paul says in today's text? Absolutely not. He says, process it as quickly as you can, and if, by the grace of God, you can, make sure it's done by the time you what? Now, we know it all often doesn't work that way. Sometimes it takes us years to process and be freed of anger. Absolutely. But he is offering, he is exhorting us to an intention. Not to deny it, not to dismiss it, but find ways to work through it and be done with it. So what is the value of anger? What is the value of anger? I want to just mention two things for your reflection, not to elaborate on them. The value of anger, the primary value that I see, is to motivate people to stand and work against injustice. It's not anger that makes us notice cruelty or injustice. But our response to that is often is anger, right? Or rage or whatever. And sometimes in order to work against it, it is the anger that empowers us to have the strength, to have the um, persistence to work with it. So to stand against injustice is one, the value of anger is helpful. And the other thing related to that is anger helps us to set boundaries. The woman who is, let's say, abused by her spouse, if she feels she has no right to her anger, that it's not good to be angry, then the odds will be she will remain in that relationship because without anger, the chance that she will have the power to choose to leave is greatly diminished. Anger helps us set boundaries. It enables us to say, no, you can't treat me that way, that far and no farther. Anger helps us to take risks. Now, when we get angry, the Bible has this term, righteous indignation, right? Have you all heard that? So when we get angry, our reflex is to think that our anger is what? Righteous. Justified. Absolutely. Is it always? <laughs> no. But you kind of got to ask a question or two about that. Well, except for Julie. Got to um, you kind of got to ask yourself. You got to be willing to have the humility and sacred curiosity to say, is this anger of God? Before you possibly act on it. And then if you become convinced through prayer, guidance of the Holy Spirit, talking with others, that it really is justified and it is, it is God, it is, you really are God's person in your righteous indignation. Then the next question is, how can you use that anger to build up the community? Amen? We don't often ask that question, do we? How can I use this anger to build up the community? So when you have a positive intention in regard to various aspects of speech, including anger, and you're using it to build up the community, then this intention and the way you speak is going to lead to transformation in the community. Can I have an amen? If you've ever had a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with someone, let's say, who you had a maybe troubled relationship with and you'd never had a heart-to-heart -heart conversation, I'll bet you remember the time you did. Because in that heart-to-heart -heart conversation, the likelihood is that that relationship was transformed. Maybe not forever, but at least at that moment. And God's grace came in. Amen? It's really precious. So Paul is talking about intention that leads to transformation. And John Wesley said, we are going on to perfection 
in Christian love. Paul's talking about that too, even though he lived quite a long time before John Wesley. So I want to say one thing about speaking and transformation that I think we do not acknowledge enough. When I was uh, living in Berkeley, I went to uh, the first congregational church for worship service. I was not a churchgoer or an identified follower of Jesus at the time. And the first congregational church is a huge church, kind of New England style. I just, I, I really love, it's very filled with light and beautiful. And the semi-retired older pastor who did the opening, the invocation, the way he did it, it was so loving and welcoming and he just created this, this ambiance of hospitality in this large place and intimacy of a sort in this large place. So after the service, I, we arrived at the, at the coffee urn at the same time. We did not know one another. And I asked him, or I wanted to tell him how much I had enjoyed the opening and how it had kind of undergirded the entire uh, service for me. And he was putting the coffee into his coffee cup. And then he turned and looked at me and he said, making clear eye contact, well, thank you very much. And who are you? Tell me your story. It's one of the most intimate and direct and compassionate questions anyone has ever asked me. I did not experience it as invasive, but it went directly into my heart and I began to weep. And there's more to the story, but that's enough for now. I think that he was practicing what I referred to a moment ago as holy curiosity. Holy curiosity. In the questions we ask one another, some of them are holy. When John Wesley says, ask the people in your community and in your small group, how goes it with your soul this week? That is a profoundly intentional question, amen? It moves the conversation beyond chit chat real fast. And part of the blessing is, it is an invitation to the person who is being asked to share a bit of their most personal story that has to do with who they are in creation, who God is to them, what they don't understand, what they are plagued by, whatever it may be. It is an invitation to what we might call spiritual intimacy. Near the end of today's uh, lection that touches my heart, there are a number of words and phrases that Paul uses to touch my heart, but the one that he says about grieving the Spirit of God, do not grieve the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God. So now let me ask you these questions, not for you to answer aloud, but to, to receive. Do you speak as if you know that your words and how you say them matter to God? Do you speak as if you know that the words you use and how you use them matter to God? Because brothers and sisters, that's what Paul is saying. Do you know that you are important to God? Do you know that your words can grieve the Holy Spirit of God? How would we speak, both in statements and in questions, if we really lived out of that knowing with every breath we take, with every interaction we have with strangers, with acquaintances, with the people closest to us? And Paul ends in this text, today's text, by saying we are to be imitators of God. And he has said that that requires telling the truth, requires positive intention to build up the community. 
It involves transformational speech, including questions that demonstrate interest and care for the soul of others. So, the third question on your sermon supplement, if you would take it out and look at it. It's really a question about a commitment, commitment to intention. It says, what one change in the way you use speech in the coming week is the Holy Spirit at this moment guiding you now to make? And keep it simple. If you happen to be sitting there thinking, oh, I can think of four things I could do differently. Worry about the other three when you get home, okay? But would you be willing now, as you are willing, to share in a very brief time that one change you could make in the use of your speaking in the coming week that you would share at this moment with a brother or sister here? Please turn to one or two people near you and share. All right, let us... Thank you very much for that. Some of you have one that's a long one. As imitators of God, we acknowledge the deep connectedness of all God's creatures in God and the special connectedness we have as followers of Jesus in our Christian community. I would propose to you that as you live into this text that Paul offers to us today, if you are to live into that, if you are, would speak with that increasing, deepening um, offering of integrity and transparency, something we, I think, long for and are missing to a great deal. If you could learn, as we all can learn, to speak more with integrity and transparency, you know, we'll also be learning to love our enemies because this kind of speaking tends to decrease markedly conflict among people. So, I end with this. Thanks to the Apostle Paul for teaching us how to talk in 2012. And God's people said, Amen.